The rich man also eventually died and was buried in Hades, where, uh, in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. After death, the fortunes of Lazarus and the rich man are reversed and intensified. Now it's the rich man who's, or the poor man who's on top and the rich man who is on the bottom. Now, as I said, we'll discuss the, the, the central points of this parable next week. I want to just focus on these five verses and use it as a way of talking about the biblical teaching on hell because that's how these verses have usually been interpreted. Now, what makes this passage even more disturbing is that the guy in hell can talk to the people in heaven and they can see one another. And that actually has also been part of the church tradition about hell. I remember when I first came out, I was reading Tertullian, a second century theologian, and all of a sudden he starts talking about one of the delights of heaven will be watching the torments of the damned in hell. And he goes on and on and on about it. Uh, he goes, these gladiators, you know, they, they, they bring us to the Colosseum and they torture us and set us on fire and feed us to lion and they have such a good time, uh, but they don't know their time is coming. And someday we'll be in the stands watching them get tortured, but it'll be throughout eternity. Woo! And then St. Thomas Aquinas, middle-aged theologian, does the same thing. That one of our, we will watch the just damnation of the unredeemed and it will be part of our joy. I don't get that. I'll just confess to you, I don't get that at all. Um, to be able to see this happening, I don't care how evil someone is, how terrible they are, how much you hate them. How, you know, watching somebody in flames get tortured, uh, well, maybe for an hour or two. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but after a year or 10 years or a, a million years, wouldn't it start to get old? Can we turn the channel? I mean, this is getting boring. I, I, I just, I, 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 don't, I don't get that. In fact, what if you see somebody you know? What if you see somebody you love? Down there, hey, Charlie, sorry. Uh, you know, I should have witnessed to you more, I guess. I don't know. I, 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 how can you go on enjoying heaven when right outside your door, just down the block, are people being tortured in flames, being burned alive, but they won't get burned up. That is difficult. And what if it's somebody you love, your child, who didn't make it? And then, I, then there's this. I find that the, the more I grow in Christ, and I'm sure you found it too, the more that you start to not just love your loved ones, but you start to love even your enemies. You start to develop a compassion for everybody. You just have a love for people and, and, and hatred and animosity and the desire for vengeance goes out the window and you just have this love even for your worst enemies. And I'm thinking that in heaven that will be perfected, right? So in heaven I'll be loving all of these people. And now I'm really wondering how am I going to sit there and enjoy the banquet supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb when there's people that I love uh, being tortured. And then I've got to wonder... However, good, however much our love will be perfected, God's love is more than that. So he, God created them and died for them. So now i got to really wonder, how is God going to enjoy heaven while this torture is going on forever and ever? And that leads to a whole bunch of other questions, and I'm just being honest here. I'm just thinking out loud. I think these are legitimate questions. Three other sets of questions that I want to just raise that have to do with the Bible. How is eternal punishment consistent with the biblical theme that you find all over in a lot of different ways, that God's anger lasts for a moment, but his love, mercy, and favor last forever. How do you put those things together? God's anger endures for a moment, but his mercy endures forever. If people are tortured forever after they die, it seems to me that the reverse is true. God's love for them endured for a moment, for their lifetime, but once they're dead, now, now he turns on his, his vicious wrath, and it never ends. His love endures for a moment, but his anger endures forever. How do you reconcile those things? It becomes particularly challenging when you consider several other verses. For example, Lamentations 3, which, which says, Though Yahweh brings grief, he does that, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing and unending, which we sang about earlier, his unending love. For he does not, listen to this, he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to any human being. 
Affliction and grief are never God's ideal will. He uses them, yes, to punish people, to teach people, to chastise people, to discipline people, but that's never his last word. Compassion and love are the, his final word. But how is that consistent with the teaching that God will eternally afflict people in the torments of hell? Now, maybe you'll say, well, wait a minute, God's not the one uh, afflicting them. Um, They're afflicting themselves. They put themselves there. They deserve that. And I would agree with you. Uh, They put themselves there. I, I don't believe, some Christians teach this, but I don't believe that God predestined them to go to hell. I don't think he wants anyone to go to hell. But they're there, and they they put themselves there. So yes, that's true. But at the same time, being honest here, maybe I think too much. I've been accused of that, but but, but I think it's a good question. God is the one who holds everything in existence, Hebrews 1.3. He holds all things together by the word of his power. Nothing exists unless God's willing it to exist, holding it in existence. So here God is holding these people in existence in this tortured state. And Why? Uh, and the traditional teaching, he's not trying to redeem them anymore. He's not trying to teach them a lesson. He's not trying to make a point. The only purpose for their existing is to experience nightmarish pain. God's holding them in existence so they'll continue to experience hopeless, nightmarish pain. How is that consistent with the teaching that he doesn't willingly afflict any human being? Another set of questions is this. How is eternal punishment consistent with the teaching that God is love? Love isn't simply something that God does. Love is the essence of who God is. Everything God does expresses who he is, so everything God does is motivated by love. Just like the Bible tells us, commands us to to be motivated by love in all that we do. Why? Because we're supposed to be godly, and that's what God is like. So everything God does is motivated by love. Which leads to this question. How is it loving to keep people burning alive forever and ever and ever and ever? I'm just wondering that out loud. Third set of questions is this. How is the teaching on eternal torment consistent with the Bible's teaching regarding God's final victory? The Bible teaches over and over again. It gives us this marvelous picture of the end. And, 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 and it, 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 it's just it's, it's glorious. It's all glorious without qualification. The Bible says, for example... That all things will be brought together under one head, who is Christ, Ephesians 1. There's this glorious picture there of Christ reigning. Everything is now uh, uh, part of his body. It, it's, it's all under him, and he's the head over all things. And the Bible says that someday God will be all in all. His love will define every square inch of the cosmos. The Bible tells us that someday all creatures in heaven and earth will bow in worship before the throne. The Bible tells us that all things will be restored someday and everything will be reconciled to God. Colossians 1 and Acts 3 and other passages. The Bible gives us a picture of of the final state uh, uh, as being one in which there'll be no more sorrow and no more tears to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Uh, There'll there'll be no more violence and, and no more death. Revelations 21 and a bunch of other passages. So what I'm wondering, just to be honest with you, is this. How can God be all in all if throughout eternity, Satan will be torturing people, rebellious people in hell. Uh, How can we say that all things will be restored and reconciled to God if throughout eternity there's going to be this this valley of despair where people aren't reconciled to God? How can we say there'll be no more tears and no more sorrow if for a good portion of humanity there'll be nothing but, for all eternity, tears and sorrow? And how can we look forward to a day when there be no more violence if throughout eternity people are going to be being burned alive? Because it seems to me burning someone alive is sort of a violent act. And even if you take that as a metaphor, it's still a very violent metaphor denoting something violent. These are just some of the questions that I have regarding this traditional teaching about eternal conscious suffering. And it makes me wonder if there's another way of looking at things. Now, if we come to the conclusion that this is just what the Bible teaches, that's all there is to say about it, well, then then we just got to deal with that. Um, you know, it, it, some things are just beyond our capacity to figure out, and we just got to say it's a mystery. But whenever we find things in the Bible that really don't seem to match up, as I just gave you here, there's, there, there's tensions. I, I think it's, it's reasonable and even godly to ask the question, might we be missing something? 